So this is a radical equation. Make it a little smaller there so it's more clear, but I'd rather make it bigger. Uh, this is a radical equation. Uh, a radical is a root sign, and these are all square roots, actually. So there's a strategy for doing these. These two problems are a little bit different, but they're more, more alike than different. So I'm going to do these for you. And this is how we do them. We have to get rid of that radical so we can solve for X. Anything underneath a root sign is trapped. So the answer to that is to square the left side of the equation and square the right side of the equation because you have to do the same thing to both sides. But when you square your radical term, you um, it's like the squaring cancels out the square because there's something we call inverse operations. And we're going to be learning more about that soon. Not real soon, though. Um, so what this does is it, it actually liberates what's underneath the radical, which is called the radicand. And here it is, it's out and it's free. It's kind of like a jailbreak. And one squared is one. Now, all we have to do is solve this. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to add five to both sides. So I have 4x equals <clears throat> 1 plus 5 is 6. And then divide by 4. And divide by 4. So that x equals, I'll divide both of these by 2 in order to reduce them, because I know that 2 goes into 6 and 2 goes into 4, so I divide each of them by the same number, 2, and that will give me 3 over 2. And that appears to be a perfectly good answer. Is it? Let's check and make sure. So I'll have 4 times 3 over 2 minus 5 square root equals 1. Will this equal 1? Well, I don't know. Let's see. Um, I'm going to rewrite this as 4 over 1 times 3 over 2. See, 3 over 2, um, it's my hypothesis if you will, that x equals 3 over 2. So I'm seeing if it really does. All right, 2 goes into 2 one time, 2 goes into 4 two times. So I am left with 2 times 3 minus 5 equals 1. 2 times 3 is 6, so I'll have 6 minus 5 equals 1. Is that true? Well, the square root of 1 equals 1. And yeah, it's true. The square root of 1 is 1, so 1 equals 1. And this is true. So I'll put this 3 over 2 in the answer box. And that's the, the basics of solving a radical equation. When it's a square root. Now we're going to bring something else into, excuse me, into it. There's a rule. 
and it goes like this. You have to isolate your radical. Get it by itself before you square both sides. Well, I can do that. I can subtract 10 from both sides of the equation. There. And 10 minus 10 is zero, so I will have left on the left the square root of 5x. Mrs. said isolate radicals before what? Uh, you have to isolate the radical before you can square both sides of the equation. Okay. So isolate radical. Then square. So now I'll square. I'll square the left side of the equation. And I'll square the right side of the equation. OK. When I square a square root, they cancel each other out, and I'm left with 5x. Over here, I have a 7. 7 squared is 49. Then to find out what x equals, I'll divide both sides of the equation by 5. So x equals 49 over 5. Now that is probably true. It is. You can kind of do it in your head, but let's check and make sure. And in a minute, we're going to encounter a problem that shows you why you always have to check your answers when you're solving a radical equation, but I'll explain it then. So we'll have the square root of five times X, and I'm guessing an educated guess that X is 49 over five. Plus 10 equals 17. I'll change 5 to 5 over 1. 5 over 1 times 49 over 5 plus 10 equals 17. And look at this, the 5s cancel leaving me with the square root of 49 plus 10. Is that going to equal 17? Well, the square root of 49 is 7. 7 plus 10, doggone it, it does. 17 equals 17. Woohoo! So, 49 over 5 is going to go into the answer box. So the only difference really between these two equations is over here, the, the radical was already isolated. And down here, I had to move the 10 before the radical was isolated so that I could square both sides. Neither one of these was overwhelmingly difficult. Now we move on to this equation. And look at that, I've already got a radical that's isolated, so all I have to do now 
is square both sides of the equation. Okay, and what that'll give me is x plus five, make that a little longer there, equals negative one times negative one is positive one. So to solve for x, I'll subtract five from both sides of the equation. Five minus five is zero. I'm left with x on the left and one minus five is negative four. Now I'm going to check and see if that's true. The square root of negative four plus five equals negative one. Negative four plus five is one equals negative one. And the square root of one is one equals negative one. That's false. So there is no solution. The reason you have to always check your answers when you're solving a radical equation is that you never know when this could happen. My stomach is roaring. Time for breakfast. Well, I didn't need a whole page for that, did I? OK, now we're going to get into a more typical kind of radical equation. X minus 4 equals the square root of X minus 2. And the square root of X minus 2 is already isolated. So I can square both sides of the equation. Now on the left, this is going to give me x minus 4 times x minus 4 because that's a binomial. On the right, I'll have x minus 2. So over here, x, that x, times x minus 4, minus 4, times x minus 4, equals x minus 2. So we're going to have, let's see, I'll distribute the x and I'll distribute the minus four. X squared minus four X minus four X. Now minus four times minus four or negative four times negative four equals positive 16. So I'll have a plus 16 equals X minus two. Oops, I left my x off. Okay, x squared minus 4x minus 4x is minus 8x plus 16 This is a quadratic equation and the proper form for a quadratic equation is AX squared plus BX plus C equals zero. 
So I have to do the following. I'm going to subtract X from both sides of the equation, and I'm going to add two to both sides of the equation so that x minus x is zero, negative two plus two is zero. Over here, since this is one x, I'll have x squared minus 8x minus 1x, that's minus 9x, plus 16 plus 2 is plus 18. So we'll have x squared minus 9x plus 18 equals 0 plus 0 is 0. And now it looks like I might be able to factor. Let's see. There's a one in front of the X squared. So all I have to do is factor 18. Let's do that. 18 equals one times 18, two times 9, and 3 times 6. 4 doesn't go evenly into 18. 5 doesn't go evenly into 18. 6 does, but I've already got it there. So, remember that this is positive 18. It will also equal negative 1 times negative 18, negative 2 times negative 9, and negative three times negative six. Let's look and see. I need to find the pair that add up to negative nine. And sure enough, here it is. Negative three plus negative six equals negative nine. So I know now what my two numbers will be. I can factor. That's a good thing. X squared separates into X and X, and the numbers I'll use are minus three and minus six. Now I set both equations equal to zero. That is both factors, I'm sorry. This is a, bi a, a linear binomial factor. This is a linear binomial factor. I set each factor equal to zero. X minus three equals zero. X minus six equals zero. Add three, add three. X equals three. Plus six, plus six. X equals six. How terrific. However, I now have to check my two hypothesized, that is so hard to say, answers, solutions, I have to check them in the original equation, which was x minus four equals the square root of x minus two. Because one of those, or even both of those, could not check. And there's a name for answers that don't check, and I should have told you that above. Right here, we thought we had this solution, negative four. 
but there's a, a name for that because I didn't make a mistake. That really is the answer when the problem is worked correctly. But it still didn't check. So that means that negative four is an extraneous solution. And look at the first five letters. E X T R A, extra. You can think of an extraneous solution as being an extra solution that you don't need. What it really is, is it is the solution to this equation right here after you've squared both sides of the original equation. The problem is there's no guarantee that that will also be the equation, uh, be the solution of the original equation. So here's what you might have. You could have both of these being solutions to the original equation. You could have both of these being extraneous and not solutions to the original equation. Or you could have one of them being the solution to the original equation and one of them being extraneous. You don't know which is why we have to check. And I'm going to do that now. X minus four equals the square root of X minus two. And I'm going to write it twice. X minus four equals the square root of X minus two. Cool. Now, here's one solution I'm going to be checking. X equals three. And X, the other one, X equals six. Let's do it. Three minus four equals the square root of three minus two. So negative one equals the square root of one. Negative one equals one. Nope. False. I know right now that three is extraneous. Let's try six. Six minus four equals the square root of six minus two. Six minus four is two. The square root equals the square root of six minus two, which is four, and doggone. This is true. So, six is the solution to the, equ uh, to the original equation, and it is the only solution. If you write three and six in the solution box, you're wrong. So always check.
OK, so I squared both sides. That gave me X minus 4 times X minus 4 equals X minus 2. I multiplied these guys and came up with this equals X minus 2. I realized because the highest power is 2 that this is a quadratic equation, which means my equation has to look like this. So I pulled all of this stuff over there. I subtracted x so that x minus x would be zero. I added two so that negative two or minus two plus two would be zero. And then zero plus zero is zero. Meanwhile, over here, that changed my equation a little bit to x squared minus nine x plus 18. I then had to figure out how to factor that quadratic equation. And what would happen if I had not been able to factor it? I would have had to use the quadratic formula. But thank goodness, most of these are factorable. Because it's quicker. Okay, let's move on. Questions first. Oh my goodness, there are two radicals now. Are you lucky or what? There's this radical, the square root. Well, oh, no, I want it black. The square root of y minus 13 plus the square root of y equals 13. The rule still applies. You have to isolate one of those radicals. Well, this is already here, um, and that is just a y the square root of a y, so it looks like that would be easier to move. So I think what, I'll, what I will do is subtract the square root of y from both sides of the equation. And what I will have then is the square root of y minus 13 isolated because the square root of y minus the square root of y is zero. Over here we'll have 13 minus the square root of y. Now that my square root over here is isolated, I'm going to square both sides of this equation. Well, on the left, all that happens is that y minus 13 gets to come out from under the radical. Over here, on the other hand, 13 minus the square root of y times 13 minus the square root of y. And I'm going to have to multiply those. I'm either going to use distribution or I'm going to use FOIL. You're free to use whichever you choose. I'm going to use distribution. Y minus 13 equals, okay, bring down that 13. 
and multiply the second set of parentheses. 13 minus the square root of y in parentheses. And then I take minus the square root of y. And multiply by the second set of parentheses. So now, I'm going to distribute the 13. These guys aren't doing anything. They're just being lazy. But they'll be busy enough soon. Just wait. So 13 times 13 is 169. It's one of the squares I have memorized. Of course, there's not a way to memorize all of them. 13 times minus the square root of y is minus 13 times the square root of y. And minus the square root of y times 13 is also minus 13 times the square root of y. And minus, whoop, should have put my little arrows. Minus the square root of y times minus the square root of y is plus the square root of y, well, times y. I'll do it like that. The square root of y times the square root of y equals the square root of y times y. Which will be the square root of y squared. So y minus 13 equals 169 minus 13 times the square root of y minus 13 times the square root of y is minus 26 times the square root of y plus the square root of y squared, which is, let's make a little note, the square root of y squared is y to the 2 over 2, which is y to the 1, which is y. So the square root of y squared is y. So we'll have y plus negative 26 times the square root of y and 169 in front equals y minus 13. Okay. Now notice this. We still have a square root. I still have to isolate a square root and then solve both sides of the equation. Doggone it. All right, well, let's do this thing. I'm going to subtract 169 from both sides of the equation because 169 minus 169 is zero. I'm going to subtract y from both sides. Whoops, wait a minute. That one's swooping down way too much. I need room. So I'm going to make that y a little smaller there, and I will have y minus y. And what that will give me is y minus y is zero. And negative 13 minus 169 will have negative 
3 plus 9 is 12, carry the 1. 1 plus 1 is 2, plus 6 is 8. We'll have negative 182. And I'm going to bring down the minus 26 times the square root of y, and then y minus y is zero. So that we are going to have zero minus 182, making sure that's right, two plus six, yes, negative 182 equals negative 26 times the square root of y. Now, I am just going to check this out. Just for a minute, kind of go by a hunch. I wonder if 182 divided by 26, I wonder what that would equal. Seven, it just happens to go evenly. All right. I am now an extremely happy camper. OK, because this is negative 26 times the square root of y, there is absolutely no reason that I cannot divide both sides of the equation by negative 26. That happens a lot in these problems, but you can't you cannot count on it. The negatives cancel, the 26s cancel. I'm left with the square root of y equals 7. The negatives cancel, 182 divided by 26 is 7. So now I'm going to square both sides again. Let's skip a line. Just for room. I'm going to square both sides. I'll have 49 equals y. I wonder if that's true. I hope it is, but we can't be sure. So, I'm going to erase that. And I'm going to get my snipping tool. And I'm going to snip this and bring it, whoop, bring it down here and make it smaller. And then I'm going to see what happens when I put 49 in for each y. The square root of 49 minus 13 plus the square root of 49 equals 13. Is that true? The square root of 9 minus 3 is 6. 5 minus 1, 4 minus 1 is 3. The square root of 36 plus the square root of 49. I might as well wait and take the square root, root of both at the same time. There's no rule that says I have to do that. I'll have 6 plus 7 equals 13, so 13 
equals 13. Yay! It's true. And what that means is that 49 is the solution to that equation right there. So when you have more than one radical, most of, well, always, you're going to have to make a decision about which one you want to move over to the other side so that you can isolate one of your <clears throat> one of your radicals. Then you'll square both sides. <coughs> but often you're still left with a radical. And now you're going to have to isolate that radical and then square both sides again. And then you'll come up with one or more possible solutions, but you won't know until you check the solutions. Okay. Here we go again. But look, I one of the solutions is isolated. So I can go ahead and square both sides of the equation. Three plus the square root of Z minus three equals the square root of z plus 12. Square the left side, square the right side. Okay, 3 plus the square root of z minus 3. I don't have to write it that small. Goodness. There's no rule that says the equal signs have to line up. It's just better if they do, better for you, better for me, because we're less likely to make a mistake. But sometimes you just have to live with it. 3 plus the square root of z minus 3 times 3 plus the square root of of z minus 3 equals z plus 12. Now we can see it. Double checking to make sure I've got that right. Okay. Now, I'll take this 3, multiply by 3, plus the square root of z minus 3, pull that radical out, plus the square root of z minus 3 times 3 plus the square root of z minus 3 equals z plus 12. Now I distribute and distribute and distribute and distribute. Three times three is nine, plus three times that square root is gonna be three times the square root. Plus three 
plus the square root times three is also going to be plus three times the square root of C minus three plus the square root of Z minus three times the square root of Z minus three is plus the square root of Z minus three squared. And that's great. So we'll have nine plus Three square roots plus three square roots is six square roots. Plus the square root squared of Z minus three is Z minus three equals Z plus 12. Now, before I start thinking about how I have to square that, I'm going to go ahead and add like terms together. I have a 9 here and a minus 3. 9 minus 3 is plus 6. So that would be Z plus 6 down on this end plus six times the square root of Z minus three. I have to isolate my square root term. So I'll subtract Z and I'll subtract six. And I will come up here, subtract Z and subtract six so that since z minus z is zero, six minus six is zero, I'll have six times the square root of z minus three plus zero equals z minus z is zero, woohoo, Ah, but 12 minus 6 is plus 6. So check this out. We're going to have 6 times the square root of Z minus 3 equals 6. And when something really lucky like that happens, I'm going to divide by six, boom, boom. Notice I only divide what's outside the radical. Well, I will have the square root of Z minus three equals one. And then I will square both sides of the equation. On the left, I'll have Z minus three. And on the right, one times one is one. So now I'm going to add three to both sides of this equation. Z equals four. Now all that's left is to see if that four checks or not. Let's do it up here where it's easier to see. Three plus the square root of Z minus three and Z is four, I'm guessing, equals the square root of four plus 12. So three plus the square root of one 
equals the square root of 16. It's going to work. 3 plus the square root of 1 is 1 equals 4. You bet it does. 4 equals 4. Woohoo! So our answer, our only solution, is z equals 4. Yes, yes. Uh, can you go back to the bottom? I don't understand. Try again. Uh, can you scroll down to the bottom? Let me see. Ah, ah. Let me do this so you can get some more. Let me know when you've got it. Okay. Okay, great, thanks. Now we've got some word problems. Oh no. I can't make it larger because it all won't fit. So, okay. Suppose you're on a mountain top. This says that at a height of eight meters, you can see V kilometers to the horizon. So what would that look like? The horizon, nah, not much of an artist. How do you get, I don't know. Never mind, I give up. Oh, how about? And there you are. You're on a mountaintop. And there's a lot of stuff around, right? Trees and all that kind of stuff and but if you're standing here, you're green. If you're standing here and you are at a height of eight, eight meters above the ground, so your eyes are eight meters above the ground, you are eight meters above the ground, You can see V kilometers to the horizon, a badly drawn horizon, but horizon nonetheless. Okay, these numbers are related by that formula right there. V, the distance to the horizon, equals 3.5 times the square root of your height above the ground. There's the formula. How far can you see to the horizon through an airplane window at a height or altitude of 7,000 meters. Woo. OK, well, they're telling us what H is. So the number of kilometers is going to be 3.5 times the square root of 7,000. OK. Let's do it. Three point 
3.5 times the square root of 7,000. Enter. So I get, let's say 292.8 kilometers. You can see almost 293 kilometers. So 292.8 kilometers to the horizon. All you have to do is multiply. And how you get a square root is you put, if you've got a TI, you push the second key and then the X squared key, and that gives you a little square root sign right there, right there. Okay, and one more, one more. Uh, can I see that question, please? Y yes, yes. Okay, that's good, thank you. Okay. Now, have you ever wondered how if you, if, if your car, if you're driving and your car rear ends somebody, you hit someone from behind, uh, their car, how you get a ticket? This is the formula that the police use to measure how fast you were going. That's what R is. All right, I'm going to read this. This formula right here, and I'm going to write it down here, R equals 2 times the square root of 5. L, capital L, okay. That formula can be used to approximate the speed, speed, in miles per hour of a car that has left a skid mark L in feet. So this is the skid mark left by your car on the highway. Skid mark in feet. Uh, okay, now how far, how far Will a car skid? So we're looking for L. Let me let me put a circle around L to tell myself this is what I'm going to find. How far will a car skid at 70 miles per hour? OK, so if you're traveling at 70 miles per hour, we need to find L. But since two goes evenly into 70, and two is not under the radical, it's multiplying the radical, I'm going to do this so that I can have the radical completely isolated because I'm going to have to square both sides. There. All right, now 
I have to square both sides because I have to I have to solve for L, but L is trapped under a square root radical. So I'll square the radical to take it off and I will square the other side of the equation as well. And then I'll find out, well, I don't know what 35 squared is. So 35 squared is 1225, 1225 equals 5L. And then, ooh, this doesn't look good at all. To solve for L, The length of your skid mark, let me write that down. The length that your car is going to skid is 1225 divided by five. 245 feet. I'm thinking of a football field. I'm going to divide that by three. They don't say to, I just want to, because there are three feet in a yard. Almost a whole football field. Almost. Yeah. Is that right? How many yards is a football field? Football as in American football. I don't think it's 100 yards. I'm showing my ignorance. I'll have to look it up. Anyway, that's how many yards. So 245 feet. Yeah, it's 100 yards. It's 100 yards, okay. So almost a full uh, uh, football field. Scary. Really scary. Okay, gang, this is our work for today. So go solve your quadratic equations. And I'll be getting the video up as quickly as I can and these notes. And they will be in week seven, the week seven module in Canvas to help you out. And remember the test is Monday in the classroom. So study the practice exam over the weekend. All the problems on the exam come from the practice exam. Yes, they do. See ya. Bye bye.